All right, uh, we, we started looking at Genesis last week, and just as a, uh, uh, for a little bit of background, uh, suggested last week that as we look at, at, look at Genesis, we're going to look at it in terms of, in terms of story. So I was talking to a guy last night about that, you know, reading scripture as, as story. Uh, because then you, I think then you get what the meaning, the intention of reading, because I think that's what the writers are doing. They're writing stories. Um, when we look at the book of Genesis as a whole, there seems to be three strains, at least three strains. A lot of folks have suggested three. There may be more. Uh, you know, who knows? This is just looking at something that was written, you know, 2,000, 2,500 years ago, finally compiled. I would never compiled. remember. What's that? I would never remember. Remember? Oh, the stories? <laughs> Long ago. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, to me, it seems like yesterday. Uh, <laughs> the, um, but the, we talked about three strains, and one of the ways you can, and we talked about it, and I keep on mentioning it because this is really important as we look at the story, because we're going to run across uh, the stories standing sort of distinctly. In fact, we'll look at two of them today. Uh, but we'll also next week see a story where you've got these strains that are kind of blended into one, which is really kind of fascinating. Uh, the Genesis was finally compelled much later than some of the stories were written. Some of the stories go way, way back. Genesis is some, someone or ones compiling these different stories into a, a book that teaches lessons. And we'll look at what those lessons are uh, in the passages we're, we're focusing on today. One of the th ways you can spot these stories, these strains, is by the name used for God. Because in some of the, and, and then when you look at the name used, you see other characteristics. Uh, there's a, a strain that uses the word El or, or Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God or gods. And when, when God is called God, that tends to be in a certain strain. There's some certain characteristics. When you run into that, uh, often uh, God appears is more a little more distant, appears in visions. You know, so if you see in, in Genesis a story about God appearing in a dream, that's usually in this strain. And it's going to be, God's going to be called God. Uh, that's, that tends to be you know, one of the characteristics. You've got another strain where God is called by those four letters that refer to God. Now, the Jews, Hebrews, would never say those four letters. It would never be pronounced. Uh, you know, Christians, often we tend to pronounce them. Whether we should or not, I don't know. But the Jews would never pronounce those four letters. And instead would use the word Adonai, which means Lord. And so when you're reading and you see Lord God, that's this strain. And the Lord God strain, with those four letters, uh, tend, God tends to be very personal. You know, he physically appears to him. He has conversations with people. He's very, very intimate. Uh, that was a strain that probably is the earliest. Because as history goes on, usually... God doesn't become more personal. He, God becomes a little more distant. Uh, and so the, the more distant God may be more recent. The, the real personal God tends to be the older. Also ten, comes from the south, southern Palestine, because a lot of the people and places for this earlier strain are southern locations in Palestine. The other one tends to be more northern. So it's, it's where these stories develop. Now understand the person who's putting it together, they're not stupid. So they recognize that these stories have differences. I think it's amazing that they didn't go in and rewrite it and just use the same word because it enables us, because they must have seen value in it, enables us to look at it and, and see the different lessons that are coming from, from these stories. You got another strain, we're gonna see it today, uh, that is the most recent, they, they call it a priestly strain, and they are the bean counters. You know, they're the lists of begotten, 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 yeah. begotten. They just love that. Keeping track of, of names and, you know, places and events. That's, that's their thing. And that's the most recent, probably the most recent. Uh, in the Bible, the book of uh, Chronicles, the books of Chronicles, 
probably priestly because you run into that characteristic over and over. They will not use the personal name for God in any of their material because, again, that infers too much intimacy. They don't, feel com- don't seem to feel comfortable with that. Far more emphasis on sacrifice, and, and that's what we see in Chronicles. A lot of emphasis on sacrifice and procedure in the temple that you don't see in the books of Samuel and the Kings, which is the same history, just from a different angle. Okay, so anyway, we looked, that's sort of a little bit of background. We're going to see it over and over again. Last week we looked at the two stories of creation in the first chapter, and, and this becomes a good illustration of these different strains, because in chapter one we've got a very definite story of creation, right? What happens in chapter one with creation? What's the chapter one creation? God speaks. God speaks. Boom. And what happens? It happens. happens. Bang, it happens. Voice of God. Now, again, when you look at the first chapter, you are not going to see the Lord God mentioned at all in chapter one because that's not the name used for God by the writer of the first chapter, the, the story that was passed down. Okay, so God speaks, bang, it happens. What else in this story? The the first chapter. So we've got speaking and God acting. Humans were the end of the chapter. Humans are at the very end of creation. You know, the culmination almost as though humans and they're given the image of God and humans are told to care for creation. So it becomes, they become the stewards of creation. So it's almost like humanity was created for creation, the culmination of creation to care for. We've also got some really interesting patterns. At the beginning of chapter of the cre- this creation, what's present at the very beginning? Okay, at the very beginning, that's right, that's a first creation before the first creation, before God calls out light. What is there at the beginning? Well, what kind of void? Black void. Where is it a void? Oh, it's a. I don't know. <laughs> Remember what? Okay, what? Alice, what did you say? Space. Well, it it is, but what's it filling that space? Water. Water. That's it. The face of God is above the... It, the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the deep. There's water. And remember, we've talked about... We talked about that with the Gospel. Water is a symbol of chaos and the tends to be a symbol of chaos in the ancient world. And God is bringing this order out of chaos, creates this bubble inside of this chaotic water with the waters above and the waters below. And that's going to be pertinent in the flood story we'll look at next week. You know, that... But that's what's happening in that first chapter. We also looked at day one, what he creates in day one, light and dark. Day and night, what does he create on, on day four? The sun. the sun, the moon, and the stars. That which, the lights, he calls them the lights in the sky. What does he create in day two? Critter. Not, oh, no, on day two, separates the water, creates the dome that's the sky and gathers the water together. What does he create on day five? Well, he creates... On day five, I'm sorry. Yeah, day five, he creates the, the stuff that lives in the water and lives in the, in the sky. So day one, light and dark. Day four, the lights in the sky. Day two, the sky and gathers the water together. Day five, that which lives in the sky, the birds and what lives in the water. Day three, now the dry land and vegetation. And what does he create on day six? The animals. Animals, that which lives on the dry land. So, you know, we've got this, we've got this pattern inside of, of this created order that I don't believe is an accident. And because it's too... Almost, you'd say, almost organized, too mechanical, which is conveying, the writer is conveying what to his audience? Our God is, is an organized God. It's not just random things on happening. There's a structure to creation and there's a structure to God and human beings are created to take care of the structure and this law that was, that the people will not receive until Moses becomes really important. Uh, in the created order, and that is the Sabbath, the Sabbath, that God rests on the seventh day, which ties this Mosaic law, you know, resting on the Sabbath. That says it's not just a law that God decided to give to Moses. This is something that is in, eternal and intricate to, 
to creation. This is part of the created order, uh, which is really kind of cool. But that's what the writer is, is communicating. Now, that's in the first chapter. Again, God is called Elohim. It's called God, or <coughs> actually God's, because that's plural. Okay, then chapter 2, boom, we got something going on different in chapter 2. What's going on in chapter 2? He created man. Now we got creating man before he creates the earth. Anything else. And at the beginning, the earth is mud. It's, well, it's dry. It's dry because he calls us. Yeah, we, that's what he makes men out of. Remember, it was all dry and a mist comes up from the ground. Dust. And, and, you know, so he, it starts with dry land, which may tell us about the different audiences. You know, that if you're not a accustomed to being around the ocean. No reason to talk about a water creation. You know, if you talk, if you live on land, if you're herding sheep, maybe dry land makes more sense. That's your, your life. Ocean doesn't mean anything to you. Okay, so it's a dry creation and the first creation is mud man. Little mud man. Is a little mud man. That, that must be why, honestly, think of, you know, when you're little, you play in the mud and you make... Make little figures. Little yep. Now, there's a, there's a story in the, uh, one of the uh, uh, apocryphal, and that means not true, uh, stories about Jesus, uh, one of the Gospels that weren't accepted in the canon, about Jesus and his friends creating little mud animals. Only the difference is Jesus breathed life into his and they, the birds fluttered away. Yeah. yeah. Until a bully came and kicked the little puddles they were working with. And it's really bad, though, when, you, when Jesus is playing in the mud and you, you stomp on the mud puddle. It, you don't do that to Jesus. No. In this story, Jesus does what? Kills him, uh, which is... Jesus was, was, in some of those stories, he was... He was rough. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, he killed his teacher. <laughs> his teacher. He, he, the teacher asked him, uh, give me the alphabet. And Jesus said, um, Aleph, which is the first letter in the, in the Hebrew alphabet. And the teacher then says, thank you, give the second letter. The second letter is Bet in the alphabet. And Jesus says, I will not until you explain to me the meaning of Aleph. And Jesus is just a little boy. And the teacher says, you smart guy, bad choice. Raising his hand to Jesus, bad decision. Oh, yeah. He drops dead. A lot of, there's a lot of dying. Jesus is killing a lot of folks in these stories. They weren't accepted in the gospel. Therefore, they're not true. They're, they're just fancy. So, but here he treats mud. And who's creating the mud? God is. God is, is and again, he's called Lord God in the English translation, he's creating mud with his hands. He's shaping it. And then does what to it? Makes it Breathes in it the Ruach, the Spirit of God. Life, the little mud man, becomes alive. And God says, hot, hot dog, we got to make him some friends. And he creates the animals. And remember, it's breathes the same thing in time, creates them from the well, soil. Then we think Adam was lonely, needed. Yes, needed somebody with him, and um, creates the animals, and um, which is which is great. Put plants a garden, puts it, and the uh, unfortunately doesn't find um, that. Okay. Yes, a dog is sufficient uh, for Adam, a companion. So creates a a woman for Adam. And they're in, and they they're placed in the garden, bang, right in right in Eden. Okay, so in the second, in the first story, if human beings are the last, and remember, it says God created him, God created them. You know, so we have a creation of you in the story of Adam, which by the way means human being in Hebrew because he's from the Adama, the dirt. You know, then Adam is the human beings are the first creation. And all of creation is made for humanity. Where one, humanity was like made for creation to care for creation. The other one is creation is made for human beings. And it's kind of interesting because he doesn't talk about authority over that creation. Uh, which, is, which is interesting in the second story. Okay, so that's what we've, that's what we've got going on in the, uh, in, in the first and second chapter. Now, when we get to chapter two, uh, chapter three, and this is where we, we are, how 
What's the situation with Adam and his unnamed bride? Unnamed companion. What is their situation? They are in the Garden of Eden and Eden. It's a wonderful place. Eden is a great place. And, and what else about this situation? They aren't supposed to eat. They are not supposed to eat from the tree no, of no, knowledge no, of good and evil. They're not supposed to, supposed to do that. Now, all of this was made for humanity. Now, one of the things that I think is always interesting is when you when you hear when you hear the name Adam, you know we think of it as like a proper name, Adam Smith, you know. But in Hebrew, when a Hebrew reads it, the word is humanity, you know, human being. And if you read this, and every time you hit Adam, instead of saying "Oh, Adam" as a person, you said "human being." You know, how does it change? You know, the application a little bit. How does it change how we interpret and apply the story? It might change it a little bit. But anyway, so Adam and his companion are in, in this garden, uh, and they're, they're doing fine. Just can't eat this tree. What happens to them when they're in this garden? Okay, here we've got a, a serpent. And the writer, and again, the writer will tell us all we need to know. We want to be real careful not to put extra stuff in here because if it was extra stuff, the writer would have concluded it. So we, what does the writer tell us about, about this serpent? He was very crafty. He was very crafty. Was, was very crafty. Uh, now, understand the, the idea that the serpent and Satan isn't going to be introduced until much later. It's, it's not inherent in this story. You know, it's not, that's never going to be a connection. But people later are going to connect it, are going to say there's, there's a connection there. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, there isn't in this story. Uh, but there is something interesting with, with the serpent. Remember, these guys are writing, as they write these stories, they're writing to people living at certain times and in certain places. We're talking about values. They're writing to people that have certain life experiences, certain values. They know certain things. And for us, a serpent doesn't mean a huge amount other than, you know, my wife is terrified of serpents, won't even look at them on TV. Oh my you know, she won't, if it's in a picture book, she'll turn the picture book. You know, she, she's terrified of, of snakes. In the, in the ancient world, uh, the, in other words, the audience that they're getting, that's receiving this, particularly in agricultural, people who live in agricultural areas, serpents are a fertility symbol. Serpents are fertility symbol, and and I don't want to I don't want to belabor it, but just think about a serpent and what it might represent to to an ancient person, and that's why it became a symbol for fertility, and the, so the serpents so the a lot of ancient people viewed serpents as as not low animals but high animals that you show a great deal of respect for because if you want your crops to grow, you know. Serpents represent that which you want to see happen in your in your fields. Wasn't that the, the symbol in Egypt? The the, the, the uh, it's on a caduceus. Yes, the, right, exactly. So serpents were considered were considered very special in the ancient world. Now the fact that the serpent is played here and the serpent does not come off looking good in this story. Whether this is like an elbow that the writer had towards all these ancient cults that viewed serpents as gods or not, you know, I don't know, but it sure would be appropriate because the serpent comes off looking really bad here. And if you wanted to attack another religion, you know, another belief system, attacking their god would be the way, might be a way to go. And, and that's what seems to happen in the story. So that's kind of hovering around in the background. But the serpent, the serpent ends up appearing. And I think it's almost incidental that it's a serpent. That's not, not particularly relevant. Uh, what, and what, does the, what does the serpent say? He told them that if they ate of that tree, they would, they, they would know as much as God. Well, what does, what does a serpent say to him? Because we've already got the same thing. We've got the... the, the God saying, don't eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've got, already got that. Already established. What's the first thing the serpent says when he approaches the woman? Did God... Did God did, you're, you're in this wonderful garden. 
Did, did God say you shall not eat of any tree in this garden? Okay. Did, did God really say that? Now, what is, what is the serpent doing? Because we the writer's already told he's crafty. What is that serpent doing? Causing doubt. Okay, it's causing, causing them, causing maybe some doubt, or at least causing question, right? We, the reader, know that God did say it because we, we've already read it. And how does the woman, and this is really interesting, how does the word, so he's suggesting that or that she questioned, or this is a question he's asking. How does a woman respond? Now, her response is, is really interesting. How she does she adds respond? to what God says. What's that? She adds to what She God adds says. to what God says. She says, you know, she, what does she say to the, to the serpent? We're not allowed to eat it, but we can't even touch it. We can't even touch it. So she, and I think that's, that, that's not accidental. One, when you look at scripture, you don't assume things are just accidental because if you do, then everything can be accidental. So you can't pick and choose. Well, they really didn't mean it. I think he meant it. When she says, you know, we shouldn't eat it, in fact, we shouldn't even touch it. That's what God said. Did God say that? No. 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 So what is she doing already? Which kind of gives us, man, we already know. We already know what's going to happen. You know, what has she already done? She's made herself a God. She's made herself a God. She's, she's choosing to distort what God has actually said. She's adding to it herself, right? Which is really interesting. And what, how does the serpent respond to it? Uh, it'll make you a God. Please. Yeah, you first, he says, no, you're not going to die. You're, you're not going to die. So you're supposed to, you, first, you question what God said. You know what he promised is not is not going to be true, and then what does she? Then what does he say? She would be like God, knowing good from evil. You're going to be like God. Your eyes are going to be <coughs> opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Well, as we read the story, is he right? Uh, yes, he is yes, he is right. Their eyes are going to be opened, and they're going to know good and evil. You betcha. That's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, if, they, uh, if, they take, if she does, disobeys God by eating the fruit, their eyes are going to be open. But he's wrong in that they're not going to die because they are. You know, and that's going, to be, that's going to be the problem. So what does, he, what does that serpent use, this crafty animal use to convince the, the woman to disobey God? False logic. Well, uses some false logic. To what does he appeal? What does he? What does her, he? Her desire. Her okay. Her vanity. Her desire to be do what? To be what? God. To God. be God. Now remember, we just studied Romans, right? What did Paul say was the ultimate sign of human sin? Idolatry. idolatry. And how did he say idolatry hits? Christians at the, their most sensitive level. Whenever they start thinking of their way is right over God's way. When they start putting themselves as God. When they start assuming that what they, and we've talked about it, mentioned it in the sermon. You know, when, when, we, when they assume that what they want is what God wants them to have. When we assume that what they value God must also value. When we start doing that, then what have we done? We've created an idol out of ourselves. We, we are worshiping the reflection in the mirror. And assuming that reflection is correct, is correct and is God. Is God. Is God. And I'll tell you, once you find a reflection that's as cute as we are, you don't look for another one, right? You know, so cute and as wise as we are, you don't look for another reflection. Uh, that's only going to screw things up. So he's, he, the appeal is to, to her, her vanity, right? Because she, her desire to be God. Now, um, what will this enable her, even by what the, what the serpent is saying, what does, will that enable her to do? She'll be able to determine what's right and wrong rather right. than let God's standard be the same. She will determine what is right and what is wrong because she'll know. Her eyes will be open and she'll know 
good and evil. Therefore, she's going to have to constantly do what? What is she, what, by eating this fruit and having eyes open, what is she now going to be bound to do for the rest of her life? Make choices. She's got to make choices. She's got to make choices now. Didn't have to before. Now she's got to make choices. Constant choices between what is right. right and what is wrong. What is right and what is wrong. And there's a way that seems right to a man. A a- way absolutely. Suggests. Absolutely. And even if you take what God, you think God is saying, you're doing it. Mm-hmm. It's still what you're, what you're doing. So this is, in a sense, then she's getting, she's acquiring power over herself and the world around her. You know, this is what's, what they're going to have by having the eyes, her eyes, open. But that comes at a cost, yeah, right? She loses a lot. What does she lose? Being taken care of. Yeah, she, loses with being, God. she loses relationship, an innocent relationship with yeah. God. That's, that's gone. You know, because now she can see the world, the world around her as it is. Okay. Now, when you think about, that's why I wanted you to think about this in terms of using the word human. How does this relate to humanity? What, what is this story pointing at with us as, as, or ancient people when they read it? What is this story about? We have to make choices. It's about humanity. That we are, for whatever reason, we are bound to make choices. choices constant choices. That's the human condition. Making, constantly making choices. A lot of people have read this and said this is where humanity grows up uh, when she eats the fruit because now human beings are moral creatures. They aren't before. They are now moral creatures because they have to choose what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. So now they've got the thing that a lot of Christians will say is, is incredibly important, will argue. To, now, once they eat the fruit, humanity will have what? Free will. will. Humanity will have free will. They don't have any innocence left. That's it. They co- when you 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 sacrifice the innocence mm-hmm. when but you can't you be innocent they, anymore. You have to make. They have to make the choice every day to continue to believe God. Continue to believe God. What God said. Mm-hmm. They make that choice every day. And then they chose not to believe God. What, what, I, I think what the what he's what he's suggesting is that wasn't a choice that they had to make at all. Before the tree, there was no choice. They didn't have to choose to trust God. They just did. They had to choose not to eat. Well, they just, ah, yeah, that was part of the created order, that you've got this, this, this thing. But it wasn't, as soon as, they, as soon as they see this difference between good and evil, because before, there's only good. You know, there's, you're not choosing what is right and what is wrong because everything is good. Right. Is right. Everything is right. Which I think is also tied to, and I think that's, you know, I told you last week I do a, used to do a workshop of the Bible in 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I, that's, that was my point, that the, you look at the whole canon as one story, that the end, in Revelation, in Paul's description of the recreation, is sort of a restoration of Eden, where you, you don't have a choice to make. There's, there's absolute freedom because we don't have to choose. We're not bound to making that choice between good and evil because the only possible, the only possibility is good. good because evil is gone. And so the whole scripture is going back to, from Eden to recreated Eden. So uh, anyway, that's, I think that's a good, bib- good biblical flood. There are other ways to interpret Anyway, so, so we've got the woman loses, and, and this is now this choice that she has, which kind of violates, you know, the, this innocence. She ends up doing what? Giving it to Adam. Well, first she says, it, it is good to, to eat. eat it. it looks good. It's a delight to the eye. <coughs> the tree is there to make you wise, which is true, which is true. And so she took the fruit. And she ate it. And before, you know, if anybody wants to lift Adam up too high, you know, it took some convincing to get the woman to do it. How much convincing did it take Adam to do it? Not much. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. 
Although, Peg, I think she put it in an apple turnover. <laughs> the apple in the she he thought he was eating a peach, oh, yeah. but uh, yeah, apple dumpling. That's that's what it was. So he had put she put ice cream on it. He didn't even know what he was doing. Wait uh, a man's heart. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because men are really stupid uh, <laughs> as was, a gender. I didn't uh, say that. Yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> Speaking as one, I can say that. In Adam's defense, <laughs> yeah. In Adam's she didn't defense. die. Well, yes, yeah, she didn't die right, right yeah. then. But yes, yeah, that's so right. There you go. That's right. You have yeah, that's right. That's right. What is this, honey? Oh, go ahead and eat it. You know? I didn't die. Right. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but still, God told him not to do it. Well, still, what yeah. is what what is? And you talked about innocence, and I think that's that's beautiful way to view it. What immediately happens when they eat? They realize they're naked. They realize they're naked. And uh, no, naked. Naked. That's what it's naked. naked. That's what we say down south. Uh, naked. naked. Uh, so they found that they were naked. Uh, and um, what do they end up feeling? Embarrassed. They feel embarrassed. Uh, they they feel shame. And this is something new introduced into the garden. We have shame because now their eyes are open and they see good and evil, and so they're starting to make judgments. And they they judge that this is wrong. wrong, and therefore you do something about it. So they try to cover themselves up, and and again this is this early strain, this this Lord God strain. So what are we? Who enters the the, the scene? God, God, and what is God doing? Walking He's walking in the garden. He's not appearing in a dream. You know, he isn't way up in heaven, you know, calling things into being. He's walking in his garden. You know, so we've got this personification of God. And and what do the human beings hide. do? Hide. They they immediately hide. And and why do they hide? Because they're ashamed. Because they're ashamed. Mm -hmm. because, because they're ashamed. Mm -hmm. And and they know they are now making the choice of what is right and wrong. And and God knows it, although we've got this little little conversation. And when he asks them, you know, what have you done? I love this. When he asks her, uh, or asks him, you, you ate from that tree, didn't you? Yeah, and what's that a, woman you Yeah, did. that's the first thing is, it's her fault. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's not me, God. her fault. He said it was God's fault. <laughs> yeah. He said it was God's fault. <laughs> 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 That's right, the woman you gave me. That's right. But whose fault is it not? Not mine. It's not my fault. No. Not fault. Now we have come as a society so much further because the people, particularly our leaders, never would do that. They all take responsibility for their actions, right? They would never say it's somebody else's fault, would they? My goodness gracious, that would we would we would judge them, wouldn't we? Hold them accountable. So if you well, gain weight, right. it's my fault. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So anyway, it, he immediately says, a good point. Your fault, her fault. You made her. She was the one that did it. It's not my fault. Yeah. So he says, what about you? And she says, says his fault. <laughs> So what are we, what are we seeing happening in this in this garden? No accountability. Life. We we have we have fighting. We have no accountability. We have a loss of innocence. We have people making decisions and making decisions that are wrong, wrong, not good. Even from our standpoint, we're recognizing that they're that they're wrong, and there now there's something else introduced into the garden when God starts. Speaking to him, and and what does God do with respect to the serpent and the woman and the man? Curses. Okay, that means there's now a punishment, a punishment or at the very least accountability. You know, when you when this is what when this is what you choose to do, now that you're bound to make that choice, you're going to be accountable for the choices you make. And the serpent, and again, I think, I, I really believe this is, you know, the writer giving an elbow to all those cults that view snakes as holy things really? because they enhance fer uh, fertility of the soil. Uh, the snake, what happens to the serpent? You can't walk anymore. You can't walk anymore. You've got to crawl on your, and how, you know, how degrading in the dust. 
you know, you're in the you're in the, the lowest the dust. Floor. You're in the lowest dust. You, you were made from I mean, the dust. Wasn't, when he was talking to her, he wasn't really. Well, I think that um, I think that's outside the realm of the story. Oh, you okay. know, and, and because I don't think it's I don't know that that he loses legs or anything yeah, like that. Okay. Because I I think again this is a story yeah. to to teach something. So I don't know that yeah. the you know the writer is. Is getting into that, um, but the serpent is going to be—he is going to be the lowest of all. And crawling in the dust. Remember, the dust is what, where everything came from. That's what God shaped into him. And you're going to be—you're not going to be back. A little mud man. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You're not going to be a mud, a little mud snake. But you're going to be as close as you can get to to a state before creation, because you're going to be crawling. And not only that. Human beings are going to be are going to hate you. They're going to be stepping on your head as you're crawling. Now, boy, this is if if he wants to kind of attack, you know, these these agricultural cults. He's, he's not doing a bad job of of really knocking down their their god. But the most pertinent is what he says to human beings, and what does he say to the woman? You will greatly increase her pains and childbearing. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna hurt to have babies. Babies are not going to be, are not going to be easy, and uh, in spite of the fact that um, a, a lot of uh, women don't believe that men can identify. Am I not right? Am I right, Van? Can, we can't identify with the pain women go through through no, childbirth. We yeah. Well, I, I I think I can because I had this splinter <laughs> once that was it. Man, it was really it really hurt. Uh, so I'm I'm thinking I can identify. You know, with uh, I had the flu last year, and it was pretty bad. Have you ever had a kidney Yes, I have. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've had two. Yeah, so I can I can kind of identify a little bit. Did uh, they make you pass it, or did they zap you? They made me pass it. Yeah, yeah. They made me pass it. So I delivered a bouncing baby, but my kidney stone was 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 sure high. It was yeah, it, it, it didn't it didn't weigh five pounds. That kidney stone. So it, it was yes, it didn't weigh, but it was all jaggedy. Oh, I don't even want to get into it. Uh, and that's twenty. Uh, so yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. She's going to desire to have babies, and she's going to have to let you be the boss. Yeah, dominion, and he's going to exert dominion pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, so he, that's the curse. And what about you, the the man? He's going to have to really work to make the ground. It, it is going to be hard. He is going to he is going to going to sweat to get the soil to be to to grow, and and what is at the end? What's what's the final at the end of the curse? You came out of the dust. You, you came out of the dust, dust, and you're going to return to the dust. Which means, remember, the God breathed into the mud man and made him a living thing. The time will come when that breath. That's it. The breath is withdrawn, and you become back. You return to, dust. to the dust. dust where you where you originated. Now, really interesting. We don't have any. And certainly here, we don't have this idea of soul. Uh, it, is, it is physical, and what animates is the spirit. And when the spirit leaves, you become dirt, dust, and you return to the dust. So what God said, when God said you'll die, yeah, boy. Yeah, boy, that's what's going to happen. And, and you know, when you, think, when you think about it, you know, this kind of becomes humanity's story. Um, until Jesus comes, it, until until Christ comes, and that's why it's all tied, you know, all connected together. You know, I want you to think about this as as a, a father with his son or a mother with her daughter, and the the child comes up and says, you know, w w you know, why, you know, why do people die? And when the well, let me tell you the story. Instead of let me give you the biological explanation about life and death. Let me tell you a story. We chose to make our own decisions. Yeah, that's, let, yes. let me tell you a story. Why do, why, why do I have to right and wrong? Why do I have to learn about right and wrong? Let me tell you a story. You know, let me tell you a story. And, and that's what I think this is intended to be. This is why it was written and why it was preserved. 
And I think when we look at it that way, I think we, get a, we, we, we let it breathe because all of a sudden it talks to us. This is our story. This isn't the story of two people. This is the story of humanity here. This is what binds us. And it's interesting, right after he says, you're going to tell that, uh, tells the woman you're going to be dominated, What's the, what is one of the first things that human being, what the, what's one of the first things the man does? Which shows the ultimate, shows that he has power. What does he do? He names her. He names her. Uh, which means he has power. You know, he now has power over her. Uh, and, and the name is not a, it's not a flattering name. Really? Eve is not a flattering in Hebrew. Eve, the, the word Eve is the Hebrew word for crevice. Crevice. Oh, for heaven's Like sake. hole. That's what the word means. In Hebrew. Not a flattering name at all that he gives her. And he it's not a sweet name. He's, he's, only purposes. Yeah. He gave that to her because he had to be explained by God too for eat from that tree so his she convinced him to eat her. So that's why he does that. He, uh, this is the state of humanity. Now. And it's not a good state. You know, we, really easy when you teach, tell this kid story to little children, which you, they need to hear. This is not, this is not a sweet story. This is, this, is, this is not a sweet, kind story. Uh, this is about the loss of innocence. But, but, so we've got behavior, and we're going to see this pattern in the next story. We've got behavior, right? And consequence, right? Yes. And one of the consequences is he can't live in the garden anymore because the garden is for what? Pure. For innocence. That's the place of innocence, so he can't live in the garden. But what does God do? Which is absolutely amazing, and we see this repeated. Well, even before, what does God do? Adam and his wife, now Eve, they've, they've disobeyed, and they're paying the consequences for it, Right? And shame is introduced into the into hum, humanity. What does God choose to do? He banishes them. Well, He banishes. So you can't live in Eden anymore. You, this you cannot live in the garden anymore. Because remember, He told Adam, "You got to work the grain. You got to eat from what you grow." What does else does God do? He makes them clothes. He makes them clothes. Well, he makes them close. Now, we're going to see that again, you know, in the story, of, in the next story we look at. So you've got this pattern that you've got human action, consequence, and then down below a little sign of grace. A little sign of grace. To this shamed humanity, God <coughs> makes them close to cover their shame. Gosh. To take away some of the embarrassment. Some of the embarrassment. He makes them close. Wow. But he still cares for them. That was still right. Like, you know. That's exactly right. So we don't have this Lord God in this story is not presented as this distant, unattached. But we've got a God who intimately cares about those the creatures he made. Now immediately we're thrown into the next story. And what happens in the next story? And humanity, if humanity, Adam and Eve are here and what they did, humanity is going to slip a little bit further. What's the next story? Adam and Eve produce After a child. After they produce a child, and they name him? Cain. Cain. And they, he has a brother, and they name the brother? Abel. Abel. Wouldn't it be nice to have twin boys and name him Cain and Abel? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, the... Um, so you've got Cain and you've got Abel, and what's the difference? Now again, we're talking about a story here. What's the difference between Cain and Abel? Um, Cain was the farmer. Cain is a farmer. He took care of the animals. Took care of the animals. Now, looking at, at the Jewish history, which one would is good? Of course, which one's going to be viewed as a, in a higher sense? Mm -hmm. of, of, with, with the deal. I mean, with the, how did Abraham? make his living. He was, he had sheep. He was a shepherd, right? Yeah. How did Isaac make his living? He was a shepherd. How did Jacob make his living? He was a shepherd. So which one is going to be better? 
Duh, the shepherd's going to be, the shepherd's always portrayed as better. You know, the herdsman, you know, than the, than the farmer. Remember, he's just t- trashed the, one, one of the fertility one. gods of farmers the in one. the story of Adam and Eve. So you've got Cain here growing crops and you've got Abel. And what ends up happening with Cain and Abel? They fight. Well, they, before they fight, what becomes the purpose, of the focus of that fight? They disagree with Jealousy. Well, what, what's the basis of the jealousy? God accepted it. Okay, bang, you got Cain and Abel both making an offering to God. That's a good thing, right? Both making an offering of God, but the offering of Abel yeah. Yeah. Is, good to God. Has, is, is received in high regard, but not the offering of Cain. Okay. Now, why is the offering of Cain not received? I don't know why understood that. Good. I do too. Because I don't, and I think in the story he never says, which means we're not supposed to know. He never says, oh, but Cain's motivation was bad, or Cain's attitude was bad, or nah, 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 nah. You know, Abel was a good guy, Cain was a stinker. You know, doesn't say that. Which is actually really powerful and profound. Because, you know, as we live our lives, Things happen, good and bad things happen. They just do. It's not because we're better, you know, than them, therefore good things happen to us. Because good bad things happen to good people. To good people. To people. And you know what? That's part of living in the world. And for reasons that are never expressed, one offering is accepted and the other one isn't. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. How we react to it becomes really important, doesn't it? And how does Cain react to this? And remember, we're not talking about, he's not being cursed. God isn't making him, his life harder. Doesn't say that. Just that his offering wasn't held in as high regard as Abel. But that causes Cain to feel angry and and (coughs) jealous. jealous, Right? Mm -hmm. He becomes jealous of his brother, right? And what does the the Lord say? And again, we've got this personal God who is talking face to face, you know, so it's not in a dream or anything. Face to face, what does the Lord God say to Cain? He wants to know why he's angry. Yeah, why are you angry? You know? And what what is the uh, what does God tell him? If you do right, will you not be accepted? If you do right. So it's it's not about the stupid offerings. Mm-hmm. You know, if you do right, you're going to be accepted. But understand, since your mom and dad now have their eyes open, as do you, what is always lurking? Sin. Sin is always lurking at the door. Always lurking. So what is God challenging? Now that he has to, Cain has to choose good and evil, what is God challenging him to do? Now the Cain has to choose between what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. What is God challenging him to do? He has to master the sin. Yeah. Choose, choose what is good. Choose what is good, right? That's what he's, that's what he's challenged to do. Now that you've got to make the choice, make a good choice. And Cain says, thank you, Lord, and then does what? Hmm. Kills his brother. Goes out and kills his brother. His brother. You know, goes out and kills his, his brother. Um, and, and kills him in a, in a horrible, you know, let's, you know, it's like a mob hit, you know, get into the car, you know, let's go out to the field, you know, and he kills his brother. And how does God respond? He asked him where his brother was. You know, where, where is your brother? And Cain's response is, I'm not my brother's keeper. I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. And so now we have, we have sink, we are sinking to a new low, right? Adam and Eve were the first low. Now we're sinking to a new low, right? Mm-hmm. Cain, Cain kills his brother and then lies to God's face. Lies to God's face. I don't know where he is. Cain knows exactly where he is. And what does God say? He said he could hear his blood he crying says, from him. His blood is crying from the ground. Blood is crying from the ground. What have you done? What have you done? 
Now, behavior, right? Same thing we saw with Adam and Eve, right? They did something, committed a behavior, and the behavior is bad, is disobeying God, got another, Cain. So we would expect, if the pattern holds true, we would expect consequences, right? Mm -hmm. For what Cain did. What's the consequences for what Cain does? He'll never reproof. He'll never <sighs> produce fruits and oh, this and whatnot. Oh, the ground is, is, is going to be full of <laughs> what? Yeah, easy, easy for you to say. Uh, it's going to be full of what? What's, what's the ground going to be full of? It's going to be full of weeds. And this is? Yeah. I mean, most farmers know that their fields, they have to do something about the weeds because weeds always grow better than, oh, yeah. than, than plants. Yeah, yeah. Lord have mercy. Yes. When you have a garden, weeds always grow better than the stuff you want to grow. Uh, and that's the way the world is. That's, that's what, again, imagine talking to a child. Well, you know, why, why do tomato plants grow, don't grow as well as these horrible weeds? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, let me, let me tell you the it's story. It's human sin. That's yes, what let me tell you about this story. You know, let me tell you about So we got behavior, we got consequence, right? And Cain is going to be an outcast, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to wander. Oh, bad for Cain, right? Mm -hmm. And Cain says to God, what? It's more than he can bear. Oh, man, this is bad. You know, they're going to be killing me. You know, if I'm wandering around, which... It's, again, is a good reason why we cannot take this as his, anything close to historical. You know, or I would encourage you against it. Because according, if this is just historical, how many people do we have living in the world right now when God's having this conversation with Cain? How many people? We have three. Adam, Eve, did have Abel. Abel's going to get Cain. He said, people are going to kill me. Who? Who is going to kill him? You know, to say nothing yeah. of, eventually they're going to, Cain's going to what? Get married yeah. to somebody. You know, so these are not intended to be a geological history, or an anthropological history of, of the human race. It just isn't. They're meant to be stories that convey meaning. That's what ancient people do. That's what modern people do. We tell stories to make points. That's what they're doing. You know, so Cain is saying, man, if you send me out there, people are going to kill me, right? They don't know what I did, and they're going to kill me, right? <laughs> Behavior, consequence, and then what does God do? He tells him no. He says, what does he do? What does God do he to Cain? Mark on Cain? He puts a mark on Cain. And later, this mark of Cain is going to be viewed as a huge negative, or, or we said you mark Cain. But it's not. What does that mark do? Keeps people from killing him. Keeps people from killing him. So we've got the same pattern, right? Human behavior, human sin, consequences for their action, sign of divine grace. Some sign of love that doesn't negate the consequences, but sort of mitigates them a little bit. And we've got the same thing happening here. We've got human action, murder, you know, fratricide. Divine punishment, consequence. Seven times over. And then a little bit of grace. A little bit of grace at the end. Okay? And what does Cain do? Something lives on the land of the night. He leaves and goes, just like Adam and Eve, they go and live east of Eden. Oh, that wonderful Steinbeck book. <laughs> they move east of Eden. Uh, so we've got this, these two these two powerful stories. Now, when we look at both of them having the same pattern, you know, human action, God, divine response, divine or consequences, divine love. Then, when we get into the next chapter, what are we? The rest of chapter four and all of chapter five. What does that? What what do we have here? We're not going to go through all these details. Yes. We got we got a bunch of them. Now these are not. I don't think these are the priests priestly stuff. We're going to get that a little bit later here, chapter five. But we've got some key names, and just to highlight a few, we got a guy named Enoch, and this is how you know the race develops. What makes Enoch special? For one, they're living a long time. These guys. What makes Enoch special? And he's going to be in his, 
a, a fairly important figure later in scripture, particularly for the Jews. Does Enoch die? I'll tell you. No, he doesn't. He walks in and he, he, God takes him. So Enoch never dies. Now that's going to be really important because Enoch and Elijah don't die. And there's going to be a lot of much later when they start talking about prophecy. You know, Enoch at the end, the end times, you know, when the world ends, Enoch is going to become a big figure that he comes and, and tells people about the end because he never died. You know, God took him into heaven. So he becomes an important, kind of an important prophetic, apocalyptic figure. We got Methuselah. What about Methuselah? He lived forever. He lived forever. They didn't think he'd ever go. You know, he just hung around forever. Uh, what about his, his little bouncing baby boy, Lemek? What makes Lemek important? That I don't know. He married two women. Well, he marries two women, which means he was... I don't know, a glutton for punishment. I don't know. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, in big, you know, re in really big trouble on Valentine's he Day. Blessed. Yeah, he was blessed. Yeah, I'm sure. Sure, I'd describe it that way. Yeah. The, um, um, but he does something even more important than having two wives. What does what does Lemek what does Lemek do? What does Lemek say? Well, what does he? Yeah, what does he do? First, he's a maker of tools, right? And again, we talk about stories. You know what? He's the maker of tools, and one of the tools he makes is a sword. He makes them, and he uses it to kill kill a man for wounding him. He kills. He kills someone. And Lemek says, you know, remember God said about God said about Canyon, what he said about Canyon, you know, Lemek says, God may be protecting Canyon, you know, but I can do it better. I can do it better. So we've got Lemek, we've got Jubal, and what does Jubal do? What does Jubal end up doing? Because again, these are stories to explain to people later why we have these things. Why do we have, why do we have tools made of iron? Bronze and iron. We got the story of Lemek develops. Okay. Why do we have musical instruments? Yes. Jubal develops, invents musical instruments. Okay, that's what Jubal does, right? And because the line has got to continue, right? Because Cain is out wandering around Adam and Eve have Seth. has Seth, a bouncing baby boy named Seth, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, all of these are, again, to help explain, these are stories, to explain why people, when they're reading this, have what they have. And then in the fifth chapter, boy, oh boy, <coughs> we got all kinds of stuff going on, right? This is the kind of stuff the priests get excited about. You know, now I think I'm going to do a sermon series on the fifth chapter of Genesis. Now, if I did that, is anybody going to attend those services? I would suggest not, because they're going to be really boring. Uh, the um, would be a yeah, summertime would be a real good time to do it. I it, if you um. This is the kind of stuff the priests like because they like to get the names yeah. and the generations down. Now, in the New Testament, we see some of this going on a little bit. Um, and it, particularly in the first chapter of Matthew. First chapter of Matthew, the first 17 verses are beginning. You know, the, the generations from uh, Joseph to Abraham. That's what you have in, in, um, in Matthew uh, 1, uh, 1 through 17. Well, if you look at 1, 1 through 18, if you look at John, John 1, 1 through 18 is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a wonderful point. Well, I was doing a children's program, youth program, Christmas program, in Watford City, North Dakota, and I had a young man who was a little nervous, read, and I asked him if he would read it from the Bible in uh, the part of the Christmas story. And I said, please read John 
1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word. Well, he, he made a mistake. He read Matthew 1, 1 through 18. And Matthew 1, 1 through 18 is so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so <laughs> begot so-and-so. So one Hebrew name after another. And my goodness gracious. And when he started, I, I was sitting there and I was I thought, why is he reading this? And then it hit me. He turned to Matthew instead of John. And, but he did it. He read all those, those Hebrew, because I didn't want to embarrass him and say, you're wrong, you got the wrong book. He did it. He got all those names. Um, that's, that's the kind of stuff priests love. That's the kind of stuff the priests like. They like to get the names down right. Uh, then at the beginning of chapter 6, we got an odd story, and I don't want to spend any time with that. 1 through 4, you know, if you've got a heading in your Bible, it should be odd story. It's <laughs> chapter 6, 1 through 4. And what's the, the little odd story in one, 6, 1 through 4? What's going on in that? Daughters were born. Oh, the daughters of, of, of the people and their the Nephilim, which are the, the people that are in God's court, are coming down and mating with human women, and they're producing giants and heroes and stuff. All right. I'm not going to be doing a sermon on that either. Uh, you know, that won't be part of the, the story. I, I, why it's here, I don't know. I, I don't know. It just is kind of thrown in here. Maybe it shows the degrading of creation. I, I, I don't know. It's just an odd story. Maybe it's just in there to explain, you know, legends. You know, the legendary heroes. This is where they, their origin it sounds more like Hercules than it does, you know, something you see in the Bible. So, I, you know, I don't know why it's, why it's there. It is there. You got to deal with it. I, I don't, if you want to talk about it, you can. I, I don't, I don't want to talk about it unless you want to, because uh, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't know why it's there. But it lead, does lead up to what's coming next. And the next story is, is the story of... What's the next story? Story of Noah. Story of Noah, which is... And that's what's at Sights and Sounds this year. Yes, Noah. And we're going to see the same pattern with Noah. We saw with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. We see the same pattern in the Noah story. What makes the Noah story different, and when you read it, I want you to just be aware of this. What the, what the writer has done, to this point, he's kept stories distinct. You know, we, he hasn't blended chapter one and chapter two. And he could have. He could have blended chapter one and chapter, but he didn't chose not to do it. Kept them as distinct stories, even to the naming of God. You know, this this whole business in in uh, chapter five with all these names, he could have blended that or softened it, but he didn't. He kept it distinct. What they're going to do is they're going to blend two stories in with Noah. We're going to have these two strains come, and it's going to be some. It's going to result in some very interesting things going on in the Noah story. So we're in six next week. So, yeah, next week, so we'll look at uh, chapter six uh, through chapter eight. So chapter six, five to eight, twenty-two, and it's going to be the story of the flood. And remember, the symbol of chaos is, in the ancient world, is water, is water. So the flood becomes really, really important. Can you imagine being 182 years old and have a child? I want to have another one at 40. <laughs> 182. You wouldn't want to be a mom? Oh, I right love now? being a mom. Right yeah. now? No. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't. Know. I wouldn't I don't be ever in Okay, let's have, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time. Uh, help us as we go through Genesis. Uh, help us to appreciate the story. Uh, help us find the way that story might relate to us. And help us use those stories to, to understand ourselves a little better, but also to help us understand you uh, a little bit better. Help us to do that in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.